Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To introduce myself to those who I haven't met, my name is Anna Carrig and I'm Education Coordinator here at the Gallery. And it's just lovely to see your faces and thank you to those who are joining us who have travelled from interstate and also to those delegates that have come from overseas. It means a lot to have this gathering of art educators here and already there's an energy and a buzz that's really exciting in the conversations that I've been part of so far. Just before we, I introduce our keynote speaker, just a few little um, messages to convey. If you are someone who, is with, uh, who has a dietary requirement, gluten-free or dairy-free or any of those sorts of things, your lunch will be waiting for you and your morning tea and your afternoon tea at a special table in the hall close to the stage. So please make your way there and your name will be against that dietary requirement. Um, we had a few that went um, I think missed today, so just um, make your way to that table if you are one of those people. Also, if there's any lost property through these three days, we will just have it at the cloakroom if you require it. Slido is in action for this session, so you just need to go to slido.com if you'd like to write questions, and the event code is hashtag NVAEC2019, and you'll be able to be part of that um, Q&A that we have. So without further ado, I'd like to, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce our keynote speaker for today, which is John Armstrong. John is the Philosopher-in-Chief for the School of Life, an organisation with branches in 11 countries that through the application of philosophy, psychology and culture, sets out to develop a more emotionally intelligent public. He is also co-author of Artist Therapy, which he co-wrote jointly with Alain de Botton. In his keynote today, John will be offering us, I hope, a provocation as to how the artist therapy approach might alter the way that we think about the nature and intent of art education, what art education is and why we should engage young people with art. An element of the book is that it questions the way that art is often presumed to be important without much explanation. Instead, the book offers a th the thesis that art is a tool for people to tackle emotional problems in their lives, making it relevant to the day-to-day -day lives of all people. So I'm sure that in our classrooms, we've occasionally come across reluctant learners who feel that art is not for them. And I'm hoping that the approach today helps us to think about some inroads roads for arguing for the relevance of art in our lives, and perhaps will help us in these situations. Please join me in welcoming John Armstrong. Thank you so much. It's a, a real delight uh, and a, just very special for me to have the opportunity to, to speak to you about, uh, about artist therapy. Sometimes, the notion of artist therapy can seem a bit um, kind of lightweight or slightly embarrassingly just made up on the spur of the moment. I remember um, when the book first came out, some people are very close to that, that they were disappointed because because therapy is you know, just this thing that people do, but art is, how could you reduce art to therapy? How could you, how could you put together art and therapy? But um, it's actually not a new move at all. In fact, seeing art as a, a means of therapy, that is of helping our, with our emotional needs, it's actually one of the earliest visions of art. Um, the character on the right here is the, the philosopher Aristotle. It comes from a, a fresco by Raphael in Rome, in the Vatican. But, but Aristotle was the first on the right was the first person to write in the in the Western philosophical tradition to write uh, a justification of the arts. Um, in fact, we only have one fragment of that, his work on a tragic drama. Uh, tragic drama was the most important public art 
for the ancient Greeks. Large parts of their society would come together to watch these plays, uh, uh, which were often on traditional themes. Uh, uh, they would spend days doing this. Uh, the prizes for doing the best were, uh, were very, very important in terms of social prestige. It was a really central cultural activity, this tragic drama. And Aristotle asks this very interesting question. Why do this? What's so good about it? What's the value of this art? Which we can extend into the question, what's the value of art in general? And Aristotle's view is that it matters because it is therapeutic. That is, it matters because it helps us individually and collectively do something in our emotional lives which we otherwise struggle to do, but which is really important. He picks up on two things, the experience of fear and pity. It's very standard human emotions. We feel frightened of things, and our pity is targeted. There are people we sympathize with, people we don't sympathize with, people we feel a lot of pity for, kindness towards, and people from whom we withhold our pity, including sometimes ourselves. And Aristotle thought that these emotional forces in our lives need education. That is, they don't just automatically go right. We don't just automatically have a wise sense of what is dangerous. We don't automatically have a wise sense or just sense or constructive sense of who we should feel tender towards or who we should feel compassion towards and who might not deserve that. And so he thought, he, he, he sees the, the, the event of tragic drama as offering an education. It teaches us, he says, to feel fear and pity correctly, well, in a way that genuinely helps us individually and as a society. So amazingly, at the very, very start of the Western tradition of thinking about the value of art, we have an emphatically therapeutic account of why art matters in our lives, why it might matter to a society and why it might matter individually, because it helps us address specific emotional problems that really matter for our well-being and for the well-being of our society. So in, in developing the notion of art as therapy, um, it wasn't really a, an innovation at all. It was a, a way of returning to one of the, the, the most fundamental themes uh, in the philosophy of art, and one that has um, a very grand uh, and honorable tradition. But how does this move on to education? What would, a th what would therapy mean for education? Uh, slightly at random, I've picked my f one of my favorite authors. It's still sticking with literature as a way in. Uh, this is George Eliot, um, uh, whose novel uh, Middlemarch was written in the middle of the 19th century. Very. Uh, a very profound and powerful analysis of the inner lives of other people. George Eliot has a phrase that she, she liked very much, that um, if we could hear the heartbeat of the, the rabbit, if we could hear all the little sounds that are going on in the world, we'd be overwhelmed by how much there is. It's a metaphor for there's so much about ourselves and other people that we habitually gloss over. We don't notice. We don't know how to notice. And in her work, she's often taking us into the inner lives of other people and showing us what they're like in a way that is accurate and generous. And the question then is, how do you engage with that? Say the work offers you 
a therapeutic opportunity. It offers you an insight. What do you need to do in order to engage with that? Because it doesn't just automatically happen. One of the people who best framed this, um, you know, if one thinks about it in terms of literature or art, or the visual arts and so on, is what do you need to bring with you when you meet the object? So imagining um, what do you need to bring from yourself into your encounter. It's a way of asking what kind of education do you need? What, what do you need to be furnished with in order to have a fruitful engagement with the object, in order to get out of it its therapeutic potential so that you can discover in it the things that help you. When it comes to the visual arts, someone might say, well, you need to know a great deal of the historical background. You need to know when this thing was created, what the influences were, why uh, it was um, funded in the first place, where it was hung, where, who said what about it. Uh, But if we think that the task is to offer us um, a therapeutic experience that helps us address some inner need of our own, we might start to wonder just how urgent that historical background is. It's justified or it's beneficial in so far as it helps us engage and discover in the object the things that really matter in our own lives. And my own belief is that um, the arts sort of came to the idea of the museum and art education and the art for a wide public uh, just happened to occur at a point where historical, historical studies were very, very strong. And so art was absorbed into this entity known as art history. And the, the primary early approach uh, uh, from the, the middle to the end of the 19th century was to see art very much in historical scholarly terms. At other points, um, there was the idea that you need to forget everything, all your preoccupations and all your interests and the details of your life and just see the object as it is purely separately on its own. But I think that from a therapeutic point of view it's clear what you need to bring. You need to bring the material of your own life and this is what George Eliot in a sense stands for. That what she wants is a reader who will bring their troubles, their struggles with life into engagement with her description of character. So if she describes someone who's in a, a difficult marriage, which they went into freely but not wisely, and she wants the reader to be thinking, yes, but what of me? What kinds of romantic decisions may I have made? What relationship decisions have I made that might not have been so wise? How do I identify with the characters? So, so the idea is that you're mobilizing your inner life in the relation to the object. And to move more centrally to, to visual experience, This is a, a picture painted in the 18th century by a French artist I don't really know anything about. But it, it's, it represents a, a very important, well, a theme that was thought important at the time, which is how did painting get started? So the origin of painting. Now, the people who came up with the explanation didn't know what the origin of painting was. I mean, they were just making it up. But they thought that painting had uh, started when um, a shepherd boy, who's there on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the left, a shepherd boy was about to go off to the summer pastures away from the town. So he'd be going up high into the hills 
and uh, he wouldn't see his, uh, his friend again for a while. And on their last night together, last evening, she decides to trace the outline of his shadow on the side of a, a tomb or a wall. And it was this act of tracing the outline so that she would be able to remember his appearance that was considered, it was imagined as, let's say, this is how painting started. Whether or not it's historically true, it's obviously not really, um, it's maybe getting at something interesting, which is what a painting can do, or what an image can do, is um, hold on to something that otherwise we would forget. Our memories are leaky and unreliable. That is, we don't remember the important things. Lots of things slip from our minds. And painting, or the art of painting, it's a way of homing in on what would it be good to remember. So there's an, a background thought here of the things our minds are not very good at doing. And this, I think, is what the, the, the family, you know, the snapshot, even the selfie, in a way, is an attempt to do. It's to say, I might forget, so I need a record. I need a way of capturing this. But the question then is, what is it important to capture? What is it that you need to remember but that you tend to forget? So the question becomes very personal, and I think this is where we're starting to see where the notion of art education comes in and what you might need to bring with you in order to engage with an object. If it's helping you to remember something, helping you to remember a day at the beach. It's helping to remember how kind someone was to you when you were seven. It's helping you remember a look of uncertainty in a parent's eyes. Why is it, why is it helpful to you to remember that? What is the problem that that is helping you address? And this has become very connected to, as it were, what we might more broadly think of as a therapeutic encounter. So, so often a piece of something we meet that is valuable to us is incredibly dependent on the emotional context in which we meet it. Think of it, it's, it's like advice. If someone says to you, but you've got to remember You've got to remember, your mother was just very busy. That could sound like the most banal thing. Of course, everyone's busy, obviously, obviously, obviously. But imagine the emotional background is you've been, you've been very frustrated. You've been taking out uh, resentment and criticism. And my mother never paid attention. She was like, why did she ignore me? She didn't give me the thing. And the thought that maybe she was just quite busy, could have a deep impact because of what you are bringing to this memory. So what makes a therapeutic moment powerful is the amount, as it were, of our organized baggage that we can bring into contact with it. And I think this is, this is a key area of imagining what an art education could be like. That our encounter with the work becomes more powerful in our lives, the more we can bear to bring with us as well, an honest, even very, very private, the honest admission, the honest recognition of our own troubles and secret hopes and worries and longings. Let's move on to 
a second, as it were, therapeutic act, undertaking of art. And this is what broadly might call uh, giving dignity to sorrow. Um, I should say, I'm going to, my, my plan is just to run through relatively, uh, for, the, for a little while, uh, some of the, as it were, therapeutic functions of art and how it can, how it can help us. And then I really want to broaden out the discussion and really hear from you. Um, so for quite a, a, a bit of the, um, the, the latter part of, of the session, I, I would like to do it as, a, as a, a discussion rather than just me sort of, uh, explaining what I think. So, uh, so we'll, get, we'll get to that um, probably around about sort of 20 past, something like that. So, so in this case, we're thinking about um, about digni the dignity of sorrow. So what's the, what's the background problem? It's that our sorrows, our fears, our hopelessness make us feel very isolated and, and lost and defeated. Um, certain works of art can give, can, can present our suffering not as a, as it were, shameful accident of failure, but as an honorable part of the human condition. Not as disastrous, but as, and as proper things for human beings to feel. One of the It was a statement from Rothko's image of one of his melancholy paintings. It was of he said he was looking for the point where the sorrow in me meets the sorrow in someone else, the sorrow in you. And he's doing it in a in a very kind of noble, grand way. It's something that's oh, terribly embarrassing. It's awful that this is happening. So, no, this is an important, it's painful, but this is an important part of me. And it's an important part of you as well. That you suffer loss. That you can feel ashamed of yourself. That you can feel regret. That you can sense the opportunities missed that you have a sense of how you might have let another down, how there were moments of where one could have been loving and one withheld out of ignorance, stupidity, whatever. But there were so many points where something really good could have happened and it slipped through one's fingers. And then there are things that happen from the outside that are that are so unfair or so disappointing and so frustrating. And our culture can give us a very shameful picture of having those problems. And it seems to me that therapeutically one of the things a work of art can do is give those Dignity, saying this, this is what it is like to be a full and proper person. It's to have these, these shameful experiences, these sorrows, these regrets, and so on. But to get the power of that is not it's not the one engages with it in the abstract. Oh, Rothko in the 1950s was very interested in emphasizing melancholy. Well, it's understandable because it was a period of political tensions and uh, consumer culture. And, oh, that's very interesting. It's very interesting. This was a, so other people. So, ah, oh, very interesting. Yes, in America, people starting to buy more fridges and, and Rothko wants to remind them of death. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, they were obviously quite not very nice people, but you know, but now I know about Rothko. It's very, I can place Rothko in relationship to consumer culture. I'm great. But the therapeutic approach is asking to do something completely different. It's to say, 
what is the sorrow in you that needs to be met? What is the sorrow that so easily could not be dignified, could just be? This kind of, when one just falls apart and, and hides, hides all the sorrowful parts of oneself because they seem so unworthy of being noticed or cared for by anyone else. So the educational move is kind of prior to the object and is asking something really quite tricky but very serious, which is what would be going on in your life? When would you need this thing? As an aside, one of the most difficult things about art education, I feel, is that we're often encountering the object at the wrong moment. It's a sunny day, it's the morning, um, uh, and, and, yes, and this person's going, yeah, I've got the answer. You know, I, I, I can meet your, I can meet the deepest, saddest parts of you. So, well, last night at half past 11, that would have been great. I really needed it then. Um, or could you come back on you know, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. because I'll need you then. But right now, maybe not. So I think one of the tricky, one of the difficulties is that it's so dependent on us being in the right frame of mind in order to, to discover our need for the object, or to learn about our need for the object. And this is, you can see, this is a, this is a very tricky thing because in our society, so we're probably not very used to saying, um, what is the sorrow in me that needs to be met or would like to be met? When do, when do, the, when do the, uh, the sadder parts of me feel very lonely or very ashamed? So it's not just that art can meet us at these points, but that for that to happen, we need to be, as it were, primed to bring those parts of ourselves into engagement with the object. Um, now, I want to talk about the, Michael, the, the expansion of sympathy, the, the enlargement of compassion. Now, as a whole, I would say our society is not hostile to compassion at all, really. But I'm curious about like, the, the extension, the enlargement, the, uh, the question of who deserves compassion. And one of the things that works of art can do is invite us to direct our compassion in ways that we hadn't particularly imagined we should. We hadn't, we hadn't been, uh, we hadn't as yet been, been taught to do. So you could say that at, at any point a society is a kind of, a sort of secret competition for compassion. Who deserves it and who doesn't? Um, And this image, of, which is entitled as Broken Heart, is, I mean, for me, it's very moving because it's taking someone who is not, in a sense, a natural target of compassion, certainly for me. Um, that is, I don't, when I look at, when I imagine this person's life, what I'm imagining is this is the person whose life I'm not interested. This is the person who 
when they were driving in front of me um, and we turned around the corner and they drove too fast or they didn't drive fast enough or who in the queue took too long or who argued with the person at the check-in uh, at the airport. Or who, this is the person I don't want to feel compassionate for. This is the person um, who I'm frightened of. And what makes the image moving to me, what makes it therapeutically important, at a more personal level, is the powerful suggestion that in the, the depths of this person's soul are as you know, big as the ocean, that, that loss for them is as real as loss for me, that their hopes were as complex and precious and that it would be very very helpful for me to feel closer to this person so the therapeutic move as I see it is about finding the points where we don't want to be compassionate and then helping us to extend our sympathy. So the way this, this, this is a lucky, lucky strike for me, because this person has been moved out of the, of the normal context in which I would want to not engage with them. And they put them in this kind of eternal ocean, which which really speaks to me. And under this very pure sky. And so they're brought into a context, into an aesthetic context, in which my capacity to be compassionate is extended. But the, the bit that I really want to stress is, is that the, the, it's not so much that artists know exactly how to do this, but they're trying to do something very important, or at least in certain cases, trying to do something, which is to work out how to actually extend a feeling of closeness when one doesn't particularly want to. It's not just of saying, oh, you should feel compassion, which is just a demand that doesn't make anything happen as opposed to a therapeutic move, which is like, what would it take? What would it take to awaken a greater feeling of intimacy, a greater feeling of tenderness, a greater emotional space? What would, what would I have to, how would I need to present this person you're, that you're afraid of in order to lessen your fear and grow your sense of emotional connection. How would, I, how would I need to present them in order to do that? And I think this is a very kind of big missing part in our, in our culture. Um, it's also a, also a huge grand theme. Um, so here's a, another example of, um, this is the Lady of Shalott, and um, from uh, the 19th century, uh, just a waterhouse, and part of the a pre-Raphaelite movement. And I suppose what intrigued me is the Lady of Shalott has a kind of really nice life in many ways. So there's a poem written by uh, Tennyson, and she lives, uh, the Lady of Shalott lives in this tower. Uh, she lives alone. Um, she's got uh, nice things. She's a bit bored. Uh, she's, she's kind of safe from life and she looks out of her window and she sees the river and she sees the fields and she sees the city in the distance. But most of the time I think, my God, she was so lucky. And then she gets bored. Oh dear, just be grateful. Anyway, she gets a bit bored and, and she sets off on this journey to experience the world and, um, and in fact uh, it doesn't work out and she dies. And you think, it's sort of like, it's very hard to know what the, what the sort of underlying meaning of the story is. It's sort of like, um, 
don't explore. Um, but, um, but, but the point is, I think what struck me is, is the, the, she really stands for, this is a sort of stand, this is standing for the person, again, another sort of person, I don't want to feel sympathy for this person. I want to make their troubles sound a bit ridiculous. And this, and this, I think, is where the therapeutic move comes in. And there's a background thought of, what are the parts of oneself that one can't be sympathetic towards? The genuine troubles that one doesn't want to acknowledge in oneself. And so, so I, think, I don't want to see her as having a difficult life. I don't want to feel compassion for her. I want to say, she's lucky, she doesn't need my compassion. So I think there's a whole lot of, a whole, a whole group of the, the, the person who is thought to be lucky is moved away from, is set apart from the world of sympathy and kindness and compassion. And you know, that can be seen at a political level, but I'm interested in it at an intimate level. It's a refusal to feel tenderness towards a person who you think it's their fault. So in a, in a relationship, you go, This person's got a nice life. Why are they complaining about me? This person, you know, or, you know, or one says, ah, oh, you know, well, I was only late for the airport, but you know, we've got a roof over our head. Why are you complaining? One wants to push away and say, lots of things don't deserve to be taken as genuine suffering. And she says at one at one point, so I am half sick of shadows. You know, Way, it's very hard to pin down what is it that's troubling her, but something really is. That one could feel sorry for a person because they're just not sure what they're trying to do with their life. And that doesn't sound dramatic. It doesn't sound like I've got an urgent need. But in terms of the reality of suffering, it could be, it, 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 it's genuinely important and, and, and that it applies back into oneself as a, a problem deserving of being taken seriously. So I think that one of the things that, you know, around compassion, one of the things that, that, that the therapeutic move is to say, it might, it might sound very slight, but to you it's actually a, real, a really big deal. So I don't quite know what to do with my life. And the artist is going, well, that is actually a big thing shouldn't just be brushed off. Say, well, you're fine, you've got a nice boat, who cares? You know, it's, 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 let's, let's not worry about what other people will say. It clearly does matter to you, so let's explore that properly. Um, this was, a, 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 just to stick with the compassion theme for a, a moment longer, it was a great theme in, um, uh, in the history of Christianity. Uh, this is a, 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 a print by a Rembrandt, it's called A Christ Preaching to the Poor, but it's not really just the poor that he's preaching to, it's the, he's really preaching to the horrible, the people one doesn't like, or the people that are not liked by their society. So it's, it's kind of like preaching to those who are outcast, not by, as it were, the, the malign forces of society, but, but in a way, the people that ordinarily decent people actually don't like very much. So it's the criminals, it's the, 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 the tax dodger, it's the person who, um, uh, the mean employer, it's the, uh, it, it's the guy who robbed you. It's not just the person who hasn't got that much. It's, all, it's also the people who behave very badly in ways that we really don't like. And, 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 and so one of the, the sort of fascinating moves at certain points, and Christianity kind of stood for this, it stood for lots of other things, but, but, but one of the themes one can draw out is this idea of, of 
even those who really don't seem like they deserve any tenderness might deserve tenderness. But I think that makes it sound very political. But I think the therapeutic move is really personal. It's the parts of me that I think couldn't be loved, couldn't be understood, couldn't be forgiven. There are, as it were, admissible bad things. I wasn't very nice to someone. I was a bit late. I got a bit worked up. And then there's all the sort of the inadmissible things one feels, oh, if I said that, people would just, oh, they'd abandon me. That time when I got so angry, and I, or that time when I got so drunk, that time when I you know, one can't bear to think of it. I, I mean, perhaps you don't have any of these experiences. I'm standing here alone, but um, but 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 I'm hoping. I, I, I'm kind of assuming that. Look, we do know. It's the parts that one feels. I really. I've left the. I've left the group of the people who, have, as it were, forgivably bad. And I fear that I've, a part of me has entered the zone of the people who are just really not very nice, just sort of slightly unforgivably bad. And I think that this is what, uh, is what the experience of a work like this, which is trying to get us to see the beauty and the grandeur and the, as it were, the elegance of this occasion, the majesty of this moment when uh, a kind of eternal kindness is coming into these neglected, abandoned, hopeless parts and illuminating this sense of, you know. <laughs> so sorry, that, you know, that you, you know, you're not abandoned. It's not that this is. It's not that this is a. It's not that this is a truth. It's not that this is. Not that we know this really will happen. It's that the belief that we can be understood is is so important. So this is a, a, a as well a thera therapeutic theme, but again, so much about how do you set it up so that the work can do this to us, or that we can do this with the work. So the education isn't of saying, well, uh, the, the important thing about this uh, print was that it cost a certain amount, and uh, Rembrandt did it in a certain period of time, and it was sponsored by so-and-so, and the techniques, and da da da. Um, all that might feed into it. But that really what I'm trying to do is, say, what is the bit of me that needs to encounter this? And how, does that, how can that meeting be set up? Um, this is again, it's another image of, this is of, of, of really of the theme of consolation. It's the idea that there's someone who's strong, who's on your side, who will listen. This is a, a, a Buddhist statue from, uh, well, from um, maybe Pakistan or Afghanistan, the sort of area there, uh, from about the third century uh, of the modern era. And it's really, an attempt to create, I think, I mean, I'm just making a, 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 as we're a therapeutic move here, an attempt to create a good parent, an attempt to create um, an object, a persona, that will um, be able to absorb your need for understanding. Um, so if you want to say, why is this a powerful object? Well, it's powerful because of the need that we have, um, that it, it's our feeling that we won't be listened to, that we won't be taken seriously, that uh, we'll try to say something, but the other person will be too busy, that, um, uh, that, 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 that we won't, that our, our true needs won't be comprehended, and so. But here we've got an image of a, as with a person who does understand, and their serenity and the the image of strength, that they're, they're going to be able to cope and take, a, take, a, take anything that we, can, that we can give them. Oops, sorry. 
Um, uh, just to consider from a last therapeutic theme, that would be um, the idea of the everyday and the ordinary. So very often art is framed as, now we're going to encounter something important, something, something rare, something special, something you don't normally get to see. And here with Warhol, we have, in a sense, the opposite of that. He's saying, well, no, I'm just going to show you a thing that really, in a way, you could see anywhere in every shop. You could open your kitchen cupboard and see pretty much the same, or maybe even better, because right? it would be real, not just, a, uh, uh, not just a print. And in a way, there's a sort of horrible irony to, um, to Warhol's work that, that making the image becomes sort of celebrated and, and, and expensive, and that to, to own one of these prints would be kind of incredibly glamorous. But actually, the real underlying point is, no, that's not, where, that's not actually where the glamour lies at all. What, what the object is trying to do, this therapeutic move, is to redistribute glamour backwards and say, no, it's having the actual can of soup. And it doesn't have to be a Campbell's soup can. It could be just any can. That's the exciting thing, you know, that you've got these, that these ordinary objects in our lives are actually wonderful and lovely and that we can have an appreciative relationship to them. We can be proud of them. It's like shining a spotlight onto these humble things and saying they are very lovely. They are small pleasures, small delights, things that um, uh, give us uh, or can give us satisfaction if we pay attention to them, but normally we don't. So he's putting the spotlight there, stopping the clock for a moment, so that you look at this thing that you would normally overlook. Now, art has been doing this in different ways for a long time. Um, this is a, a, a watercolor called um, February in the Isle of Wight, um, and uh, from the 1880s. And in Isle of Wight in the south of England. And the, the reason that it's, uh, the, it excites me is um, February is traditionally the month that people hate most in, in England, certainly, uh, because it's the coldest, it's most dreary. It's, but okay, okay, every so often there's a nice day. And the artist in a way is saying, let's, let's take the neglected bit our society has primed us to love summer when the leaves are full and it's primed us to love uh, autumn when the colors are rich and it's primed us to love Christmas when uh, in the north uh, the holly tree is there and, the, and the, the, the so on. And, but it hasn't really thought about what could be nice about the 9th of February. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's got interested at various times in dawn and nightfall and so on. But this is just like, it's the middle of the afternoon. It's not any very special time. And nothing very much is going on. And it's, it's saying, let's look very appreciatively at the things that are around at that time, which we actually do like and care about. Um, it is very nice, the little patterns that the branches make. Uh, um, the bare branches make at the top of the trees. Um, it is very lovely the way the grass is slightly longer at one end, you know, as it starts to go up the slope. Um, it's very sweet the way uh, the, the, the purple of the, of, of the cliff is there. Um, and all these things are, uh, as it were, pleasures that we might tend often to overlook. So, these are the these are the sort of underlying themes of the therapeutic moves that we can perform around uh, works of art and of the the background that that helps us um, engage with works in this way. Um, now there are lots and lots of more things to explore or discuss, but I, I think maybe uh, the way to do it now would be to um, you know I've, I've presented a number of strategy, you know, the sort of strategy of how you might engage, and to, to really to get a sense from you of um, where, um, 
uh, of the kinds of problems that you might see with this or the ways in which it could be expanded or changed or developed. But certainly I would like to bring it into, into conversation with um, uh, the, the concerns and interests that you have. So I think if we could open that up now to discussion, we've got really quite a good time uh, to explore things in a bit of depth. Should we, can we? So, I'll start with the question from the slider. Mm -hmm. So, I'll just have to speak into your microphone. Oh, sure. <laughs> So we had a question from the audience from Slido, so if anyone wants to post questions, please do. Why is sorrow the particular emotion which needs to be engaged with through art? Surely we can connect, understand and recognise many emotions in art. Oh yes, um, absolutely. That was, uh, the, the preoccupation with sorrow is really just a sign of my lack of um, intelligence, really. I mean, it's that, no, it, it, it's that it, 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 it comes to mind, somehow one gets preoccupied with a certain theme uh, at a particular moment. But no, absolutely. Um, I, and, and I think this is a, actually a very apt point, that in thinking about right. what are the emotions that, that, we, that might be deserving of therapy? Aristotle started the ball rolling with, with fear, and pity, and that sort of gets the, the theme of sorrow going. And I think rather, um, I kind of rather kept with that too much. But it's entirely, I think, useful to say that we could we could imagine a similar process for other, um, as it were, more positive emotions. So if you say. Uh, right, so if you go, what about enthusiasm or excitement um, or delight? The process there is of, I think, of asking what is it about the thing that excites me or delights me? So imagine I was looking at this uh, Isle of Wight image. Now, this is, this is, it strikes me as a very uh, intriguing object because, um, in a way, it's quite a boring picture. Um, and it would be quite normal to say, if you come across it in a museum, you go, oh, my God, it's just got this boring picture of the Isle of Wight. Why on earth would anyone want to look at that? And some people quite like it, and most people not that interested. And you go, well, that's just how the world is. Um, and you could imagine... Um, person running a gallery going, what are we going to do? How on earth will we ever get anyone interested in this? Um, so the way to frame it might be to say, look, here is someone who's enthusiastic about, about the Isle of Wight. From a therapeutic point of view, we start with the fact that our excitements are often not very specific. So imagine you've had a really nice day and you go, uh, you know, let me, let me explain to you on let me explain to you what was so nice about my day. It was really nice. So well, tell me a bit more. Well, um, uh, it was just quite exciting. I had a nice lunch, and then I had an interesting chat with someone, and it was sunny. And we, you know, we have something really good has happened, but it's quite difficult for us to be specific. I saw this lovely tree. What was lovely about it? Well, I don't know. It was lovely. It was great. We can't. We're not identifying what it is about the thing that we love that is powerful for us. And this is a very, very standard human theme, that it's really hard for us to be specific about the power, about what it is that gives an object its power to charm us or to delight us, and what it, why that matters to us. Um, I think our brains are probably more constructed for complaining than for praising. Someone goes, why is so-and-so awful? You can know, write these reams of stuff. And then, why are they lovely? And you go, oh, you know, they're really nice. They, oh, they're funny. Um, they're sweet. And you know, uh, uh, we're, we're so much less focused. Um, perhaps I've just spent too long with my adolescent children. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, where the ability to describe what's wrong with someone, particularly me, is very, very extensive and 
beautifully developed. But anyway, so, so one goes back here, and you are imagining you're asking this artist, so, so you went down to the Isle of Wight uh, in February and you had a nice time, and yeah. So well, what was nice about it? And he's in effect saying, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you. There was a, a wisp of cloud that just overlapped a bit with some branches, and that was really nice. And then there was a bit of shade on some grass, and there was a small, almost a kind of youngish sapling, but not so young, quite close to a more mature tree. And I really liked the interplay of this slender um, a trunk against the slightly larger leaning trunk. And I liked the banding on the barks. Oh, and I also really liked the way in which you could sort of, there was a sort of dip, and you saw beyond that a bit of, um, a, a, a bit of cliff face. And I really liked the way the light was striking. And, and what, the artist has gone into a lot of detail to convey what it was they liked about what they like. And in a way, the therapeutic move is very general here. It's not so much saying we should like what this artist liked, but think of how enormous this project is of can you convey to others what it is you like about what you like and why you really like it. I think this is a very, very large piece of, um, that's kind of missing in our more general education. And in reality, it's one of the kind of great themes of any human culture. How good is it at explaining to itself why it likes what it likes? And uh, how, how much insight can it actually have, does it actually have about the real sources of its enjoyments? And I, d I don't think that our I, I don't think that our educational project has really embraced probably how big an issue this is uh, in existence. So I think that although we often sort of, we're starting off talking about you know, uh, as, as we're art education around a specific kind of 19th century um, landscape uh, picture, we're, we're actually talking about a very fundamental human capacity that doesn't easily get developed and needs to be developed. And this is one of the places where, where we meet it. Um, sorry, is there another, another question? Hmm. So another question that's been asked is, what about the role of art making? Is there such a thing as art making as therapy? Oh, oh yes, certainly. Um, so it, it, there's, in fact, it's um, probably more widely discussed at the moment is this idea that it could be therapeutic, or indeed it is obviously therapeutic, to make, so to make objects. Um, though, of course, it's often the opposite of therapeutic. That we, you know, we, have, a, we have a culture that would like to believe, you know, because this, so someone says, ah, I was feeling very worried, and then I went and I made these things, and, and I felt I'd released my tension, I'd released my anxieties. And you go, well, I so hope that happens for you. That's marvelous. But um, very often, the human experience of creativity is not, in a sense, a straightforwardly positive one. Um, one of the real uh, difficulties is that so often, a creative impulse is governed by an experience of failure because Anyway, I, I suppose I'm talking about the, uh, my, my encounter with this is really through writing. It's really that the predominant, the 99% of the experience of writing has to be, this isn't very good. Otherwise, one would just stop at the beginning. Um, it has to be that, I mean, in a sense, the, what makes someone try hard is that they're weirdly not satisfied. I think the way one can imagine this is through someone playing tennis. Imagine you're the best tennis player in the club. You're not just the best, you're much better than everyone else. You're great at playing tennis. You have a lovely time every time you play, you win, you win. Fantastic. And then you compare this with, so you're having a marvelous time. But then you compare this with 
the mind of you know, someone who wants to be the best tennis player in the world. Now, you're playing your backhand, you think, oh, that's fabulous, oh, that was so stylish. And they go, that was a terrible backhand, I can't believe I did that. Oh my God, I was so slow to get the ball, it fell so far out of the, you know. And the, the level of, as it were, disappointment has to be quite high for the person, I mean, just catastrophically high in many ways for the person who wants to get really, really good at, say, playing tennis. It's very strange. They have to be annoyed with stuff that would satisfy most people. So I think that in, um, around creativity, there's often this, as it were, anti-therapeutic theme, which is of the stoking of frustration and disappointment, and particularly when an object is going to be judged by a wider public, in which it's completely straightforward to anticipate people going, actually, I didn't really like that very much. And that, and that there's a very frightening encounter between, sort of, well, I made this thing and I wanted people to like it, and it turns out, well, they politely said, but probably you know, not that many people really liked it. I think that the, the couple of things that really is, is seem important there are the, the background thought that the making the thing is going to be quite difficult. That, that it's normal for human endeavors to be frustrating and difficult and not very satisfying. So you can imagine, you can imagine the picture of what it's meant to be like when you do something interesting, or you do something you're proud of. And it's meant to be like, uh, you know, I did it and it was easy and other people liked it and it felt great. And of course, when that doesn't happen, one thinks, oh, I've done the wrong thing, it didn't work and so on. As opposed to sort of the therapeutic move, which is, well, of course, when you try to do something that is worth doing, you will meet with people who don't like it. You will meet with people who say, um, not only are you not very good at it, but it's not worth doing. Uh, you will meet with people who don't understand it. You will meet with people who wish you'd done something else. And, and that this is not sort of a sign of failure or anything. It's just the territory on which these things operate. And the as it were, the therapeutic hope is that we can get less disturbed by these things that just happen anyway whenever you try to do something. And that this is, uh, I, I think, a very tricky area. It's not, in sense, it's not just the person who is writing their poetry or uh, painting a picture or making this elaborate pot or whatever it is they're doing. It's who's standing up for an idea that they think is important, who's suggesting a plan that they believe in, but obviously not everyone does, uh, who wants to uh, bring about some growth or change in an institution or an organization. Um, so I think it's not, the, the, the way that I, I know that people talk about creativity as therapy, I suppose the bit that I'm trying to focus on is the kind of therapy you need in order to be creative as well, and not, not give up. Um, I, I, I'm just, is, is there, should, are there other questions that we should, or should we? We can go to the floor, but there are a few more oh, questions. Oh, right, oh, right, sure, sure. In. Okay. So another question we have, obviously, educators here is what would be a good starting point for examining artworks through a therapeutic lens with students? Yeah. Um, oh, I was rather hoping people would tell me that, <laughs> the answer to that. But let me, let me suggest some things. Um, Okay, so, so, so the area that I, that I think is, is tricky here is, it's really about what it is you need to bring. So other kinds of art education strategies have quite clear sort of what you need to put in the bag. So they're saying, uh, well, we want to learn about influences and so on, um, so I know what I need to teach you. So if someone says, I want to talk about um, 
you know, the, the role of landscape painting in industrialized England in the 19th century. And they go, right, so what the, what the pupils need to know is that while there were nice trees on the Isle of Wight, um, there were lots of factories that were belching out smoke in Manchester. And you can't really, and, and so I want you to, I want to, I know what I need to tell you. I need to tell you about the process of industrialization and factories and so on, um, and the coming of the railways. And then, then you'll be able to understand uh, why this idyllic scene uh, tells us something about the escapist mentality or something of the 19th century uh, artist. Or someone, someone else says, um, I don't want you to think about history. I just want you to think about visual geometry. So I'm going to ask you to forget everything and just look at, you know, almost like a, you might, if you saw this as a, a very early, kind of bit like an impressionist project. Uh, you know, let's just look at color relations. Let's look at the, um, you know, the, the, the way it's laid out on the surface of the paper. Um, or let's look at the, uh, the structure of the, of, of the design. When it comes to therapy, I think that we're not start, we're starting in a slightly different place. We're saying, let's, we're examining an issue in our lives. So, so here the point would be, the starting place would be quite a strange one, which is, um, how do you describe something you like? And what's nice about it? So, so it's almost like you would ask some question, like, what's your favorite place? Imagine some place that you really, really liked. Uh, try to describe it. Um, or if we looked at, uh, if we went back to, I want to do this guy. It's, the starting question is, who do you not feel sorry for? Which is quite a, an odd question to ask, and I don't know if you can ask that in a classroom. I mean, I think there's a, the, 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 there would be a much greater technique that would be needed um, to, but it's, it's kind of like, it's very difficult to do in public, but it's clearly it goes on a lot in our lives. Right? Everyone's got this personal stuff, but it's really hard to do it in groups. Um, so that in a way, one can answer, you know, it's kind of okay if the answer is quite secret. So, so certainly when I'm um, in, t in terms of our work at the School of Life, um, we quite often, uh, where well, we do a lot of, um, as it were, uh, self-knowledge type uh, exercises, quite often say, it, and it's fine not to tell anyone. Right? You might just have to, you know, the first big step might be to say it to yourself in your head about people, you know, because our society doesn't encourage us to say, well, I just don't feel any compassion for those people on the whole. We don't. But actually, the restrictions, just admitting them to oneself might be actually the main thing. And telling another person, telling a group might not be a very good way to go about doing it. Um, it's it kind of it's okay if certain things are very private. There's a difference between something being very private and it just not being acknowledged in one's head. It can be a very private and yet acknowledged. And that a lot of a lot of powerful developmental work might operate in that way. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, as it were, a public admission. It can be an extremely private recognition in one's own, you know. In, in one's own mind, in the depths of one's own mind. Um, so I think, I mean, what I'm, I'm suggesting is that it's, it, the, the starting point is a, a kind of, the cult, is, is, is almost like self-knowledge questions. Um, what is it you really like and how would you describe it? Who is it that you're not very fond of and why not? Um, what do you fear in yourself wouldn't be understandable by other people? What do you find hard to, um, you know, what do you find unlikable about yourself or unlikable about others? And these are, these are very private 
questions, but they're terribly real as well. And, and the odd thing, the weird thing, I think it's so important ultimately, is they go on and have absolutely massive consequences when they are aggregated at a political level. And it's often why political discourse is so, it seems to me, so, um, so hard to make any progress with. Because it's not so much that you know, someone has the wrong belief, it's that we can't, we don't know how to engage with people whose beliefs are so far away from our own. Um, sorry. So, so there's a question that follows from, from that, which is that once you've reached this point of evoking mm. a personal reflection from students, what's, what happens next? How can you support them once you've opened the door to that reflection? Right. Um, all oh, right. I think um, the, 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 the thought is then, and where else does this live in your life? So, so in a way, we're latching on to a, a, a general issue at a specific point. So Im imagine someone saying, well, I can, I, can, I can imagine what this guy's life might have been like or might be like, and I can start to get interested in it. Um, so one is, in a sense, exercising a general muscle, the muscle of imagining someone else's life in a more friendly way, in a way that's not so critical. Um, and you, well, you know, who else do I need to do that with? Or who else could I do that with? Um, you know, and this is a compensation. There might be people that one's much too generous to. You need to get a bit less generous. But, um, but the move is that, the move is that, well, where, where else does this apply? Um, that, that we're moving from, and I think this happens so often, we're moving from meeting a, as it were, a specific instance, and then you're exploring it as a, a general capacity. You think, where else do I need this capacity in my life? Uh, so we'll maybe have one or two more mm -hmm. questions. Um, in a world driven by competition and success, do you think that art education or art therapy should deal with disappointment and failure? Um, right, okay, so the answer I think is, is definitely yes. Um, but I think, a, look, there's a clear sense that there's a great deal more disappointment out there in the world than there is um, you know, great success. By definition, success is, is very rare. But I think, I, I, I think that what we can look at also is, as it were, the therapeutic questions around why the drive for success? I mean, obviously, the many can be many factors, but one that intrigues me is the notion that it is only if I succeed in a conspicuous way, that, that I will be safe, that I will be likable, that I will have friends, that I will have a viable life, that I will be understandable. I'm trying to imagine what is it that's driving someone. So we have to say, oh, a society driven by greed. You know, well, why are people greedy? Why would some, what is it that makes greed look like an answer? Without going, oh, it's terrible, people are greedy. Why would, it, why would it feel really important to someone to get to the top, rather than just, oh, well, you might do that, it doesn't really matter. That as well, if one can hold back from being critical and just ask, why would it seem right to someone to have the values they do, even if one totally disagrees with them. So you can ask, what would, what would have to be going on for it to seem really important? So someone goes, look, I know everyone else in the world can get on on the average income or one and a half the average. I need to have 56 times. And one says, oh, that's terrible. What would the world look like? What would, what would the inner world look like if that thought 
seemed true? What would it be like to be inside a person for whom that seemed true? That it's not negotiable here. It's not, it's not like, oh, well, I've got plenty, but I just can't think of anything else to do, so I'm just quite greedy, so I'll... Imagine someone's not like that, that internally they think, oh, my God, I might die. I, I, I got, I've got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I've got to do this. I've got to, if I don't make this thing work, I, my life will fall apart. Now, that's not necessarily, I'm not saying that's a great way to be. I mean, we could imagine the problem more seriously. I think, we might say, uh, I think a, a, a healthy society won't be able to deal with things like greed and competition until it's got an honest understanding of why people really want to succeed and, and why they feel not succeeding is so bad. And that I think that if right, there's a real problem of just demonizing the thing that one doesn't understand or has no sympathy for at all. And that it's, I was, okay, well, I'd like to sort of suggest this, that it's really hard to reform something unless you sympathize with it, unless you can imagine being like that. Otherwise, one's just scolding people. Um, I I'm, I'm, I'm slightly obsessed by this issue that a society that just scolds feels like it's getting, like the people doing the scolding feel like it's getting great. Because hmm, we are scolding them all the time. And yet, nothing, and yet actually one's building up huge amounts of resentment which go in totally the contrary direction. But I guess, as I see it, the psychology of scolding is people want, end up wanting to do the thing they're being told not to do. I guess I'm really just speaking personally because that's what I do. <laughs> um, that, and, and therefore there's this weird need to, it sounds so strange, but I think it's ab absolutely crucial, which is to, un to sympathize with the enemy. It's not to agree with them, but to emotionally have, to have a, to have an emotionally rich, intimate picture of what it would be like to like those things. And that if one wants to engage constructively, and particularly to change someone's mind, it might be extremely important to start from a position where you feel, I could be like that too. I, I, I could easily have, you know, or part of, there's a part of me, I could have ended up that. I could have those opinions. I, I can see what's nice about being like that. I realize I'm asking you to give something up. I, 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 I'm slightly obsessed with this issue about changing minds because so much of our modern political landscape seems to rely upon the idea that, um, you know, it's a, a, a conflict between people who uh, have one view of the world the people who've got another view of the world. And it's very, very difficult not to demonize the other side and to say why they're so wrong and so stupid and wicked and not terrible. Um, but of course, that stops you, which it, it, it would be fine if it was a kind of like a dictatorship. I'm not fine, but, but you can imagine it's an okay strategy if you don't have to convince people. That's what I'm saying. But if you do have to convince people, it's a terrible strategy because <coughs> you're running, you're, you're getting ever more distant from the thing which you need to do, which is to bring more people on board. And so, and so I think this idea of imaginative generosity towards the people that you don't want to be generous to is one of the kind of really missing ingredients in the world. And that's why I kind of almost want to look to this this photograph for universal salvation. If we could say, imagine what, not to agree with what we might imagine he might think, what do we know what he might think? But in a more narrow sense to say, this is someone I'm a bit frightened of, for all sorts of very private reasons. What would it be like to feel I could be friendly? 
understand and get close to him. And therefore maybe have a response to his worries that might be different from his instinctive response, but will be a genuine response to his worries. But I mean that, in a way, everyone's got a version of this. They've got a, an image that might pinpoint where their sympathy gives out, where it, where it stops. But also, this is an image that's not just about him. It's also very sympathetic to me. Right, so it's placing this person not in the context where I would be most frightened of them, or not so much frightened, but just, as it were, unimaginative, unengaged, easily kind of, easily running away to the things that really do speak to me, the ocean, the sky, the sense of the stark horizon, the, the idea that he's seen from behind, the kind of aesthetic care with which it's done. This is a, a point of contact where, I guess it's a very, it's a very specific therapeutic move. You've got the, f the tricky thing placed in a context where it's safer to engage with it. And I think, so I think that in a way, it doesn't have to be this object at all. One could imagine a version of this for everyone, of the individual version, which might look incredibly different. I was very struck in the past by um, you know, this, the individuality of where one wants, where, where one stops being kind. Uh, it's a very private question that you sort of gradually get to know about people. It might take a long time. But that they just really, they, they seem lovely in lots of ways, but they really don't want to give any time to certain kinds of people. Um, is the time, so, so that's the, the, the but is, is there any, uh, is the time for one more question? There was one more question that came through, which was that mm. in teaching teenagers, Teenagers or adolescents often yeah. say, you don't understand me. Yeah. Are there any works that you could recommend um, that engage with that idea? Um, <laughs> well, in, in a curious way, it's, it's kind of like... Yes, I, 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 can't, I, I don't know offhand of a, very, of a specific work that's just completely fantastic in that context. But, um, but in a way, it's, it's like the problem of giving dignity to the problem. So I, I've encountered this in a in a literary context, and one of my favorite quotations comes from the uh, 18th, 19th century German uh, poet, philosopher, and so on, uh, all-round superstar, uh, Goethe, um, who, who, at the end of his life, he's 83, and one of the last things he says is, um, no one understood me. He goes, I never understood anyone. No one understands anyone. And, you sort of, and this is, and you think this is really important because this is testimony. This is the guy who wrote 25,000 incredibly beautiful letters, who wrote volumes of poetry, who published all the time, who was kind of at the center of an intellectual movement, who had friends, all of And so, so, so Goethe, what was it like? What did it feel? It must have felt amazing. It must have felt everyone understood you. And he goes, no, I, I didn't feel understood. I, I thought my best friends didn't get it. I tried to write these things, and my, my experience was, no, they just didn't really understand me. That not, as it were, the thing about the adolescent, in a curious way, is they're imagining what it's like to be understood. So in a way, they think, everyone else is understood. Like, just normally people are, you know, you go around and people really understand you. And it's shocking that my parents or my friend or teacher, they, oh, they don't understand me, that's terrible. And you're like, do you think I'm understood? Do you think most people are going around going, oh, it's so brilliant being understood. Oh, 
love being understood. Sarah, do you remember not being understood? Never happens. I guess one or two people. But. No, in, in, a way, in a way, what the adolescent is meeting is a transition from being a child where you're under this kind of unbelievably benign illusion of being understood, which is, which is the creation. It's, a great, it's one of the, 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 the beautiful fiction of love that, that, that the parent is desperate to understand, or to create this feeling of being understood. And then the, the encounter in adolescence with, um, as it were, a metaphysical feature of the human condition, which is other people can't see into our minds. That, 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 that there's this huge asymmetry that we experience ourselves from the inside and no one else has that experience. And that every person, and I think this is what Goethe was getting at, which is, he, the other way he put it was, my life has been a life of fireworks that I couldn't tell others about. And I think, I think we sort of know what this is like. That you've, Imagine you've had a, you, you're waking up in the morning and you half remember a dream and there are all these things passing through your head and some thoughts are lovely and some thoughts are quite worrying. And, and you imagine trying to explain that to, and you have these moments of sympathy. You think, oh, I wish I kind of hadn't said that to so-and-so, but it was a bit difficult, but I remember how 11 years ago my father, and then I remember that. And this wonderful, incredible web of associations and sensations and thoughts and so which is what it's like to be you. And it's happening so much, and it's so dense. And no one else is going to be in there. However much they, un you know, we have interesting talks, and we exchange ideas, and they can be very sweet, and we hold one another, and various things. And <clears throat> but that's not going to remove this fundamental separation. This is a, philosophical theme that I think is, 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 is very interesting. And in a way, adolescence is a, a moment of truth where you're realizing and resenting quite rightly. I mean, why would anyone make it like that? Imagine you could invent what human beings were like. Why would you make this solitude of the soul? Why would you make the human brain so private an entity? And the, and the adolescent is kind of encountering this thought and, and realizing it's, it, the, 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 you know, how that's going to be a bit difficult. And, and, and they aren't yet armed with, and perhaps we never really properly are, armed with the resources for getting understood, which just through life is such a nightmare, really, because we get so special. We get, you know, maybe we can explain to a colleague or an employee or a boss or something a bit of and then there are things of trying to explain to one's partner like why the curtains have to be a different color or, <laughs> or, or why or it's not so much when something happens as the predictability of it's like I don't mind that it happens I don't mind if it happens in 10 minutes or half an hour as long as I know in advance which it's going to be and the, the difficulty of trying to explain why that matters all the forces through existence that have brought one to this point of not being able to tolerate a thing which other people find so easy. Oh, I don't care. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, fine. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, disaster. I don't, is it 15? Do you mean 15 or do you mean 10? Or do you mean 20? And, and, the, and it's the difficulties of explaining some, how I, why I am like this as opposed to being like being something else. And that if you are inside my head, if, you, if I could parachute you into my soul, you'd understand and you'd sympathize. And if I were Tolstoy, I could put it in, well, Shakespeare, I could maybe put it in words that would make you love me all the same. But I can't, because I didn't spend my whole life learning how to do this. And, and so I think, I think this, this idea of, if only we could find the way of communicating. And I think, we're, as it were, culturally, we're still so much at the beginning of this. And, but as it were, the therapeutic approach towards art seems to me to be in that territory of trying to help us explain in a way that's constructive why we're like what we're like so that we're not so frightened and bothered by one another. And on that pessimistic but hopeful note, <laughs> perhaps we should. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks very much, John, for that talk. And um, we will also, we do have artist therapy here um, available if anyone is interested in, in going deeper into that as well. Um, just thank, thank John again, please. <laughs> So we now break for afternoon tea, and after afternoon tea at 3.30, return here to the theatre and we'll have an artist talk with Ben Quilty. Thanks. Thank you.